When one considers scientific knowledge and its nature, Hume's statement of the problem of induction raises at least three questions. The first has to do with causation. Can we reasonably and justifiably believe that one thing can truly be said to cause another? The second is, involves what is known as the uniformity principle, which claims that the universe will act according to the same rules or principles across both space and time. In other words, how it has behaved in the past will be how it behaves in the future. While Hume recognizes that we all must behave as if, as if this is the case, any attempt to prove the uniformity principle ends up either begging the question or as an exercise in circular reasoning. Finally, he raises the question, as many before him had, of just how certain inductively arrived at knowledge can or should be held to be, and whether, given the conclusion he reaches that it will never approach the level of certainty deductively arrived at knowledge might be said to possess, that scientists are being reasonable in accepting the validity of said knowledge. As we noted in our last episode, there have been a variety of responses to Hume's formulation most notably the work of Immanuel Kant, who effectively rebutted Hume's claim that one is neither reasonable nor justified in believing inductively arrived at knowledge, and, less effectively, but still plausibly, Kant also addressed Hume's concerns about causation. Upon his response were built the ideas of Wewell, who posited that there was more than mere induction and empiricism that went into scientific knowledge creation, and those of Hemphill, Popper, and others, who suggested that science could be seen as an entirely deductive enterprise. While these approaches each had their limitations, and ultimately are thought to have failed to have addressed Hume's concerns by many philosophers of science, they provided a much richer insight into the practice of scientific inquiry. In addition to these approaches, there were others, most notably the American pragmatist William James, who assailed Hume's objection that causation could not be observed, suggesting that when one sees an observable interaction wherein one thing leads to another, one is indeed seeing causation, even if the mechanism might be unknown. Ernst Mach would take this so far as to say that it is only what we can observe that is reliable, and that any posited mechanisms of causation that are not so documented or observed are nothing more than instruments of a theory concocted to explain what observations are indeed made. In these ways, it can be said that many of Hume's objections are meaningfully addressed, even if the arguments might fail to convince the most ardent inductive skeptics of the reasonableness or justifiability of accepting inductively arrived at knowledge. What none of these approaches do, however, is address the issue of certainty. In fact, in each case, and in each argument, it must be conceded that inductive knowledge will fall short of the level of uncertainty deductively established knowledge will have at least if one assumes that all deductive arguments are rooted in logically airtight axiomatic statements rather than having some basis in empirically arrived at knowledge. Something, by the way, that is never possible in the practice of science, even in cases where deductive reasoning is applied. As such, one is then led to ask, how does one deal with the uncertainty inherent in inductive knowledge? In this episode of the Scientific Odyssey, we'll take a look at two lines of reasoning that attempt to deal with this very issue. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 4, Science and Certainty. Episode 3, Probabilities and Pragmatism. <music> As we mentioned in the introduction, in our last episode, we looked at a couple of different approaches to addressing Hume's problem of induction. 
What we saw that was while the, that while the ideas of first Kant, then we will, and finally Hempel and Popper did much for developing a more nuanced and robust understanding of the process and practice of scientific inquiry, they didn't completely address at least one fundamental question Hume raises. Can scientific inquiry produce knowledge that is certain? While these approaches certainly pun intended, made it clear that Hume's assertion that scientific knowledge rests on mere enumerative induction, seeing the same series of events in continuous conjunction, was both limited and incomplete. They did not remove his observation that since science requires an empirical foundation, there's always a chance that we have yet to observe the instance that invalidates a treasured scientific theory, a black swan as it were. Now, before we go too much further, I want to answer a question brought up by crew member Aaron from South Africa regarding how Hume's issue with causality could be relevant today. As we mentioned in the previous episode, one can certainly forgive Hume for seeing causality as an unobserved assumption in his time. Writing as he was in the early to mid 1700s, Hume lacked the robust scientific models we possess now. Things like the standard model of particle physics or the Landa CDM model. The first describe, or the latter there, describing the birth and expansion of the early universe to present times, whereas the first is a sort of matter interaction model of how things actually produce what we see when we make observations. As an example of things in Hume's time, one only has to think of when we discussed Isaac Newton and his development of what might be thought of as a force model of physical interactions and how we noted that there were really no good descriptions of how those interactions actually took place. Newton himself famously said regarding his model of gravitation that he put forth no hypotheses as to how it actually worked as a response to his critics who complained that his description, which relied on action at a distance, seemed to be a throwback to the days of mystical or alchemical ideas. Since no one could directly observe whether gravity or electrostatic influence or magnetism was, there was a very valid question as to whether causation could be said to exist in an observable way. In other words, I think, in Hume's time, it was only through constant conjunction of events that an idea like causation could be empirically constructed, and if one considered the idea carefully, there was really no logical reason that something like X causes Y should exist at all. Finally, as we also noted, it needs to be said that Hume here is making a purely logical argument rather than one which he felt should be, in a sense, practiced. He in no way advocated the rejection of the use of induction either generally or in the more specific applications found in scientific inquiry, but rather sought to clarify the justification of its use. So, as we think of what we have now, does this objection still apply? In a sense, I might sort of argue that it all comes back to how you see induction. When we look at the robust models used in physics, chemistry, and cosmology today, we see descriptions of nature that account for a vast array of different physical phenomena and that have survived rigorous testing designed to try and create results that would falsify those very models. These models have a much more complex description of the interactions, some of which can be directly observed with modern technology, and many more can be observed directly, indirectly. Yet, as Paul Dirac famously lamented, we still don't know precisely, and that's an important thing to say here, how a photon is absorbed or emitted by an electromagnetic field to produce the electrostatic repulsion between two electrons. Here, Hume might say that for all of our sophisticated theorizing, we have yet to directly observe causation. In the case of gravitation, we have no way of directly observing warped spacetime, nor do we know exactly how mass causes it to warp. Though, to be fair, we can describe how warped spacetime creates the trajectories of objects as they move along. Hence, I think that the argument can still be made that causation must be either argued for in an a priori way, as Kant does, one can't have the sort of universe we observe without causation, or through the pathway of pragmatists such as James or Dewey that say that Hume demand, Hume's demands are far too great. In the first case, to use our example of playing chess from the last episode, one can't have a game if there aren't rules for how the pieces interact with each other on the board. On the other hand, however, it's fair, I think, 
to ask just how close one has to look to be able to say that the interaction that causes something is in fact there. In the case of our two billiard balls colliding, one can see the first billiard ball moving and thus coming into adjacency with the second, and then the second moving away immediately thereafter. For the pragmatists, that's all you need. One ball is observed to collide with the second, after which the second ball moves away, and so we can say that ball A colliding with ball B caused ball B to move. End of story. However, if one claims that this isn't in fact enough, that one must truly understand the mechanism by which all of this happens, one could imagine setting up the various apparatus needed that would be able to measure the increasingly strong repulsive electric fields created by the outermost electrons in each ball as they got closer together that peaked at the point of closest approach prior to the second ball moving away. And if that doesn't satisfy the entrenched skeptic, then we could set up an experiment that would measure the interaction of the virtual photon exchange between those outermost electrons that would confirm their momentum transfer from one ball to the other. In other words, at some point there has to be a threshold where the skeptic's question of whether we can observe the interaction is satisfied. I would argue that in some areas of physics, we can say that even, so some of, even though some of the specific details of an interaction remain a bit murky, we have enough of a sense of the mechanisms of the interactions that we can safely say that we, observed, we have observed causation in those areas. While I doubt that such things would satisfy the most rigorous logical criteria, one has to wonder, given measurement limits set by Heisenberg's indeterminacy or uncertainty principle, if any observation would actually do so. Okay, so with those comments made, let's see where we go from here. The final potential solution that really tries to address Hume's formulation of the problem in all aspects that I want to put forward is one having to do with whether or not Hume's question is even logical or meaningful. In this argument, induction is said to be a foundational practice that, like Kant's a priori assumptions about what has to be true to have a universe that we can observe, induction is just valid. Regardless of whether the knowledge is certain, the means by which inductive knowledge is produced is every bit as reliable and justified as the use of deductive reasoning, especially if said deductive reasoning is ever claimed to rest on any piece of empirically arrived at information. In this argument, Hume's position is seen as a sort of quote-unquote pseudo-problem, wherein his question about whether or not someone is reasonable or justified in accepting inductively arrived at knowledge is just basically flawed. As Kant pointed out, when one bases belief or intellectual acceptance on evidence, one can be thought of as being reasonable, even if that evidence is not at a, arrived at deductively. The other question, though, is that can conclusion reached in this way be considered justified? The foundationalism argument, as it is sometimes known, is that you don't need to justify a logical process that arrives at reasonable conclusions. An argument here is made by analogy with the law and legality. When we consider whether an act is legal, what we are really asking is whether the act contravenes a law. If it does, the act is illegal. If not, then the act is considered legal. Note, we are not commenting on the morality, ethicality, or practicality of the act, just whether it is legal or not, whether it contravenes an established law. In other words, legality is established by laws. But what if someone were to come along and challenge the concept of whether laws themselves are legal? Note, we're not talking about a case of whether a specific law is legal as might be the, you know, what happens if, say, one law contradicts an older or quote-unquote higher law, such as the case of ruling a law constitutional, but rather whether having laws themselves are in fact legal. Such a question is an obvious blind alley because law is what defines legality. In fact, the example of whether a specific law is constitutional is a case that illustrates that this whole thing kind of works, in that if two laws establish contradictory or opposing acts as legal, then you have a situation of confusion. Running a stop sign in the normal course of driving can't be both legal and illegal. Law establishes legality. In the same way, a rational method of arriving at a conclusion based on evidence doesn't require justification. Now, as you might imagine, 
Not all philosophers of science accept this argument. Many will point out that there's a difference between the level of certainty in, a, in the conclusion based on deductive reasoning and those arrived at through versions of non-deductive reasoning. Just how likely does a conclusion have to be before one is no longer justified in accepting it? To use an example from our earlier episode, if only 10% of men in ancient Greece were taller than 5 feet 4 inches, how justified and reasonable is a person who asserts that Plato was taller than that actually being? Additionally, unlike the case of legality and law, where one is defined by the other, inductive reasoning can't be said to contain the definition of some truth within it. Deductive reasoning is defined by saying that the truth of the conclusion is found within the truth of the premises. Induction and other forms of non-deductive logic can't actually say that. There doesn't seem to be a way of defining inductive reasoning or associated reasoning approaches such that, you know, such as adductive reasoning or inference from best explanation, so that justified belief is a part of the inherent definition of the process. Given this, there seems to be a qualitative difference between inductively arrived at belief and deductively arrived at belief, what Hume saw as truly justified belief. For me, this is sort of where the whole logical conundrum of all of this lies. I think we'd all agree that we would be justified in believing that the sun is going to rise on the eastern horizon tomorrow, and a week after that, and even a year after that, whether that belief is based off of an enumerative induction or in a more complex description of an inductively based process. Yet, logically, it could be said that justification is a binary state, and thus, unless the belief is arrived at deductively, such justification is illusory. As an example that is less clear-cut, the risk of many cancers is said to be significantly increased through certain lifestyle choices, such as smoking cigarettes. This claim is based on numerous different types of statistical studies that establish a correlation between cigarette smoking and many forms of cancer and other diseases and conditions that is so strong that the probability of there being any other cause for them seems almost vanishingly small. There is, however, a small but non-negligible number of smokers who never actually develop cancer. How justified are we in our belief in saying that smoking causes cancer given this information? To walk further down that ladder, what about the idea that a diet deficient in, say, fiber or folic acid or some other nutrient leads to some associated form of cancer? There may be some evidence in support of such a claim, but it may be weak or not yet reproduced. In these cases, Hume's skepticism looks much more warranted. If justification means that inductively arrived at evidence must support a conclusion above a certain level, what is that level then? Conversely, to say that a relationship or causal association must meet the level produced by deductive reasoning, however, that just sort of flies in the face of a great deal of human practice in any number of areas. As we have just noted, given the evidence, one would have to be almost willfully ignorant or in deep denial to hold the opinion that smoking is not causal towards a significantly increased risk of many forms of cancer as well as a number of other health issues. In fact, in many debates regarding public policy and decision-making with respect to causation and complex system, the last refuge of the entrenched denialist is to claim, but you can't prove it, thus demanding of induction the same level of certainty as is provided by deduction for a claim to be justified. At some point, this is obviously absurd, as is in the case of smoking causing a profoundly increased risk of developing any number of types of cancer. Another example with public policy implications lies in the area of climate research, where deniers can often be heard to make arguments reminiscent of those made by def those who defended the tobacco industry in the years when I was growing up. So, if one does conclude that induction is not a valid form of knowledge acquisition, even in the light of less than perfect certainty of knowledge obtained, how does one characterize the appropriateness of justification of belief? Or, to put it more simply, how much should one trust the knowledge? After the break, we'll take a look at ways to understand that very thing. Mm -hmm.
As you probably noticed at the beginning of the last episode, while we have made progress in limiting and refining the problem of induction, it's pretty clear that the core question held within it still lies unaddressed. In other words, how reliable or certain is scientific knowledge or knowledge based on empirically collected data that is then inductively generalized and, as appropriate, specifically applied to given circumstances? As we saw, scientific knowledge does not seem to rise to the level of deductive certainty found in, say, mathematical analysis. The efforts of the proponents of the hypothetical deductive method notwithstanding, there just doesn't seem to be a way of getting to that standard of logical rigor. We can deductively prove models wrong, but we can't absolutely guarantee correctness, nor can we truly eliminate induction as a logical process and hypothesis formation. So where do we go from here? Well, there really are two paths. Both recognize the limitations of inductive reasoning and attempt to understand what can and can't be expected of those methodologies. The first is to work to create a framework to understand just how certain one can be through the use of, say, statistics and probabilities, while the second approach looks to see if there exists a more fruitful way of going about gaining knowledge of the natural world. Let's take these in order. The first approach is to, in a sense, relax the requirement of absolute certainty and instead focus on attempting to quantify how certain or uncertain a deductively established relationship is to be true. Now, to give a fairly simple sort of an approach, let's go back to that standard example of an inductive argument we've been using. Most males are at least 5 feet 4 inches tall, Plato is male, therefore Plato is at least 5 feet 4 inches tall. Now, as we've said, it's possible for both the premises to be true and yet for the conclusion to be false here. However, what we can try to do is establish how likely it is for the argument to in fact be a true statement. One way to, be, to do this would be to characterize the percentage of males in the Greek population that are or maybe were taller than 5 feet 4 inches, let's say that number is 90%, and then treat Plato as if he were a random member of the sample taken from that population, which would seem to mean that the logical argument has about a 90% chance of being true as well. There are, however, a number of complicating factors to such an approach, some of which we need to consider here. The first is what we really mean when we say there's a 90% chance of something. In other words, when we make a statement of probability, just what is it that we're quantifying? Well, in my research, what I found is that philosophers generally lump these sort of probability statements into three broad categories of interpretation. The first of these is really probability as a statement of frequency. In this case, a large sample, carefully controlled, at least one hopes, to be representative in the entire population is taken, and then percentages of those members of the population that do or don't meet certain criteria are counted, and the results are, of course, expressed in percentages. For our example, perhaps someone goes out and measures the height of 5,000 Greek males and finds that 90% of them are taller than 5 feet 4 inches, and so that's where the number comes from. Of course, the difficulty with this is getting the representative sample of the population in terms that are applicable to the subject, i.e. Greek philosophers. Perhaps it's the case that since one has to be a person of some means and stability, that the better nutrition and lighter workload of those enrolled in philosophical schools actually means that the correct representative population would show a higher percentage of people that would meet that height criterion, and thus there would be a higher probability that Plato would also be thought to be taller than that. We use this frequency approach in other ways as well, often in characterizing the behavior of physical systems in trying to make forecasts. When the National Weather Service issues a rain forecast, for example, this is really what they're doing. If you go to your favorite weather forecasting site and they say that there's a 40% chance of rain in your location, what they mean is that if you had, say, 10 days with identical atmospheric conditions, it would, on average, rain in your location on four of those days. What it doesn't mean is that it's going to rain 40% of the day or in 40% of the locations. It's a frequency argument. What that means is you probably can't predict which specific days the rain would occur on, nor would the chance of it raining on a later day be changed by whether or not it had rained on an earlier day. 
What it does mean is that the probability expresses an average frequency with which something could happen but does not say whether or not it will happen in a given occurrence. In a mathematical sense, this is a kind of probability one sees in gambling establishments or on die rolls. If I were to set a completely randomized regulation deck of cards in front of you and ask you to select a card from the middle of the deck and show it to me, the probability that you would show me a spade would be 13 in 52 or 1 in 4, 25%. Other examples are found in things like floodplains and hydrology, where the 100-year floodplain means that over a long average, there will be one flood that will reach that location each 100 years. It could be that over the course of five years, two such events occur, or that none occur for 300 years, but averaged over 10,000 years, that would be the frequency. There are, however, a couple of problems with the frequency approach or definition. The first is one we've already hinted at. There are sometimes significant difficulties trying to figure out what the appropriate sample population is. This is one of the big problems, say, in political polling. While you can survey a thousand people and ask them which candidate or issue they will likely vote in favor of, it's generally not clear that the one thousand people you got, ho got a hold of are really a good representative sample of the population. If the poll was conducted by calling only those people with traditional landlines, there will likely be a significant population skew in the data due to the fact that a majority of those under the age of 30 now only use mobile phones. This is further complicated by the data that strongly suggests that turnout on voting day for those under the age of 30 is much lower as a percentage than for those over 50, who of course are significantly more likely to have a line line. Pollsters in political or other kinds of things have to deal with this all the time and try to make adjustments to their poll numbers so that they represent an average or sample population. A second problem is that in the frequency interpretation, it's very possible for the system to change in ways that will affect the frequency distribution without the person studying the system knowing about that. In the case of the weather, for example, or actually more precisely climate, prior to the discovery of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, climate forecasters were unaware that large-scale changes in the surface sea temperatures near the equator in the Pacific Ocean would periodically change. These changes would then affect how weather patterns developed and played out over time. Thus, it was possible to make predictions based on incomplete data that missed the underlying factors that fundamentally changed the frequency at which things occurred. Another example of this has to do with the aforementioned flood cycles. Increased urbanization and paving over of areas that once would have absorbed excess water has led to regions that only flooded 1% of the time, i.e. places that were on a 100-year floodplain, to now flood 5 or 10% of the time due to increased runoff. In this way, the frequency interpretation of probability suffers from the exact issue that Hume originally raised regarding induction. And that would be, of course, whether what has been observed in the past will continue unchanged in the future. There are times when that certainly is not the case. The second interpret interpretation of probability has to do with what is known as a subjective interpretation. If I were to ask you, what the odds were of me being struck by a meteor at some point in the next year, you might say something like, well, I think the odds are like one in a thousand. Now, this expression of probability isn't really based on any sort of frequency assessment on your part, but rather it's a subjective expression of what you feel the likelihood of something happening might be. In other words, you've never really heard, you know, or seen or, you know, experience anyone getting struck, but you do sort of realize that it's a physical possibility, and so you pick a number that you think is really unlikely, but not exactly impossible. For our purposes, the problem with this interpretation, of course, are obvious. Your assessment is likely going to be swayed by all sorts of factors that have very little to do with actual systems. For example, when one looks at the data on the risk of being injured using various forms of transportation, one finds that the number of deaths or injuries that occur per mile traveled in commercial air flight is orders of magnitude smaller than those that occur in automobile travel. Yet, since the psychological impact of several hundred people dying in a single airliner crash is so much more affecting than one or two that die each time in an automobile accident, 
There are many who subjectively assess the risk falsely and say that commercial air travel is much more likely to result in death than going by car when the evidence shows the exact opposite. The third interpretation, one becoming more favored by both philosophers and mathematicians, is known as the objective or sometimes logical approach. In this case, what one tries to do is use evidence to assign probabilities something that something will be objectively true or false. Another way this can be thought of is to think of it as how likely it is true that a predictive outcome is going to happen given the evidence versus how likely the evidence would be observed if the outcome were not the case. Such an approach lends itself to the use of a number of statistical analysis tools such as Bayesian analysis and thus you know, are far favored by both these philosophers and scientists in sort of really trying to get at or understand what's really going on. The difficulties here are that most of the tools of statistical analysis that are used rely on what we might call fully separable variables, i.e. that the probabilities of the positive state are completely disentangled from the probabilities of a negative state. And so there are kind of binary states of logic, which actually may not really exist in most real world systems. Nevertheless, there has been a good deal of progress that has been made with such approaches in terms of forecasting and modeling in that a more rigorous estimation of certainty is achievable than with the subjective interpretation. Additionally, since the method can use past frequency data as well as more recent observational evidence, it can fold in the frequency interpretation while also updating its priors appropriately. It is important, however, to note that in these cases, there can be a great deal of uncertainty about the outcome, and so while the mathematics might spit out a pretty specific number, really the approach you should take is sort of a caveat emptor or buyer beware, as they say. One excellent example of such an approach is the 538 forecast for various political races, which use these sorts of methods to produce sort of a frequency distribution of outcomes. In 2016, their model for the outcome of the U.S. presidential vote gave the Democratic candidate a roughly two-thirds chance of winning and the Republican candidate a one-third chance of winning. In other words, when they ran their model with slight variations and various observational data points, Donald Trump won in the model one out of three times. Interestingly, and to their chagrin, too many people took the model and interpreted the probability in a subjective way and concluded that Hillary Clinton was all but assured the victory. A better way to have thought about the numbers would have been to have thought that, you know, two-thirds of the time when you turn the steering wheel to the left, the car turned to the left, but one-third of the time, the car actually turned to the right. In such an interpretation, one might well have been much less certain of the outcome and, at least in the case of the car, decided to walk wherever they needed to get to. The other approach I wanted to talk about is one that I've seen called the pragmatic approach. To understand this approach, let's go back to our game analogy and let's assume for a moment that the game definitely has rules, but that we have no idea what they are. Yes, we might be able to say that there are certain requirements for there even to be a game to play. Maybe, you know, those requirements are things like a board, pieces that interact, and rules that govern their movement and interactions, etc. But let's say that we don't even know what those are. The only way we can learn anything about the game is to see it played and then to try to understand both the nature of the game and how it goes from those observations. Now, since we don't know what the rules are beforehand, we can't sort of deductively work out how the game will go, the strategies for winning, the logical errors to avoid, that kind of thing. We might, however, by observing various iterations of the game by people who do know how to play it, come up with what we think are some of the parameters and rules, but we really can never be sure we've got them all or that we have them correct for every case. Maybe there's a sort of special exception, the kind of thing that you see in baseball a lot. If we get a complete enough set of sort of games through our observations, we might then be able to apply some deductive reasoning to say that if these are the rules, then this or that next move or strategy should work to result in the outcome that we want to see. If it does then do that, then we say our rules have survived the test, and if not, then we'll either modify them or get rid of them altogether. 
This would sort of be the hypothetical deductive picture of figuring out how to play something like chess or Go. What the pragmatic approach to considering Hume's problem of induction asks is, given that we can't get an axiomatic or logically fundamental understanding of the rule book for the game, is there really a better way to gain knowledge about how it works besides using induction? Or, to put it in terms of our practice of scientific inquiry, is there a better way to get an understanding of the physical universe than using inductively implied empirical evidence to form hypotheses and then using harsh, test, harsh testing to attempt to deductively invalidate those hypotheses? The way the argument goes is to consider some alternative way or form of determining the rules. Perhaps there's some form of prognostication, such as gazing into a crystal ball or reading the tea leaves, that is somehow directly connected to the fundamental laws that govern the universe, or that can tell what the outcome of a move in our game will be, to use that example. Now, for this alternative method to be successful, the rules that govern the game, or laws that govern nature, have to be uniform. They can't change haphazardly. In other words, if tea leaves give you a prediction based on their connections to the rules now, those rules can't then change before the thing actually happens. If they do, then the team relieves will have given you the wrong answer. However, as you may recall, one of the main questions raised by Hume's statement of the problem is that the assumption of uniformity of nature rested entirely on the past experience of such uniformity. So, the alternative method if we can't be sure that the rules of the game won't arbitrarily change in the future, and thus disconnect from our crystal ball or two leaves, can't be considered any more trustworthy than induction. Conversely, if nature is uniform going into the future, then we can be confident that our empirically based inductive methods will hone in ever more accurately on the correct set of rules as we see more iterations of the game being played. Moreover, if the crystal ball or tea leaves are, in fact, directly connected, our inductive methods will determine, the, determine that as well and adopt those as our primary means of predicting or forecasting future events or the outcome of various experiments. And so induction will always be at least as effective as any other method. Of course, no such predictive methodology in the sense of fortune telling, palm reading, clairvoyance, looking at the entrails of some deceased animal, etc. has ever been shown to have been able to predict or forecast the outcome of rigorously conducted experiments above the level of randomly guessing, much less approach the accuracy of well-applied inductive methodologies. In short, the pragmatic solution says that Hume is right about the difficulties with induction, but lacking some truly deductive insight, something we just don't have, we won't actually do better. In other words, maybe it's true that the tools we have to learn to play the game won't always be completely effective, but they are the best we can have. Moreover though, as many philosophers have pointed out, when it comes to science, it's not clear that deductive reasoning is actually as effective as many claim it to be. As philosopher Massimo Pigliucci points out, for a deductive argument, one must always have two premises in order to reach a conclusion. When these methods are applied to systems that are studied empirically, it turns out that at least one of those premises will always have to be inductively asserted. In other words, since it is based on what one has observed about the natural world, there's always the chance that there's some counterexample, a black swan, somewhere out there that the inquirer has yet to find. Hence, even when deductive arguments are used in reference to the natural world, there's always a problem with things being expressed as certainties if any generalization beyond direct observation is intended. Thus, one may well question if deductively logical syllogisms and the certainties they imply are ever appropriate when talking about the physical world. And so it is that we reach the end of our consideration of what may be the most foundational problem in the philosophy of science other than whether there is a preferred set of criteria that defines or distinguishes scientific inquiry apart from other forms of asking questions and seeking answers. Yet, even as we wrap up, I do want to say that we've only investigated the major ideas and trends related to this topic. 
While I would say that we've done more than a thumbnail sketch, there are many ideas we've not even begun to discuss. A lot of the conversation regarding the problem of induction can be found in the formal language of logic, thus rendering it all but inaccessible to the layperson or even the interested amateur. Nevertheless, there are those resources that attempt to make the ideas clear enough for anyone willing to invest a bit of time and energy to be worth mentioning. Foremost among these is Samir Akasha's entry into the Oxford Very Short Introduction series titled Philosophy of Science. It does a good job portraying the issues and questions in relatable terms and using easy to grasp examples. And I think that anyone who would like a solid introduction to the various questions in philosophy of science could do a good bit worse than starting there. As we wrap up, there are a few announcements that go along with this episode. First of all, my apologies for the long delay between the last show and this one. To those of you who are all caught up and are waiting with bated breath or whatever to you know, hear the next sort of thing that sort of rolls out from uh, Scientific Odyssey headquarters here. I promise I'll get back to writing in a regular habit soon, though, to be honest, empirical evidence of late would argue against this assertion, so take that for what it's worth. Second, our heartfelt condolences go out to the scholars, researchers, and people of Brazil over the tragic loss of the 200-year-old Museum of Natural History to fire on Sunday. The destruction of over 2 million unique historical artifacts is an incalculable loss to Brazil, Brazil's heritage and to the worldwide scholarly community. The museum had been underfunded for decades and was in need of significant renovations, and it is only all that much more heartbreaking that funding had just finally been secured to begin the necessary upgrades, including to fire suppression systems, when the fire broke out. In so many cases, all that is left of the heritage stored in the museum are pictures and written descriptions that have been shared with other scholars and institutions. If one wonders why a society should adequately fund such institutions, even in lean or difficult times, this should serve as a strong argument. Finally, on a more personal note, it is with a very heavy heart that I announce the passing of the Scientific Odyssey's informal mascot. From the time I began this podcast, the writing of each episode was done with my big golden retriever, Cassie, at my feet. During many of the ep episodes, she'd insist on coming into the recording room and sleeping, and occasionally snoring, while I was discussing the various topics of our journey. Perhaps, if you listen closely, you can hear her in the background. On the morning of Labor Day of 2018, she quietly passed in her sleep, and so no longer sails the seas of knowledge, waiting for head scratches and belly rubs. For those who wonder if your faithful navigator now sails alone, while her place next to the wheel can never be filled, we've been bringing along a younger Golden, Captain Charlie Pants as he is known, to help sight the stars. For those of you who have reached out with condolences, my deepest thanks. Cassie is the only dog I've ever had who adopted me, and she never let me forget that I was her person. She will be deeply missed. As we wrap up this short series, I would like to spend one more episode and look at the life and work of William Wewell. I think that there, if, if there is just one person who is most responsible for, you know, the modern concept of scientific inquiry, it might just be him. And so it behooves us to spend just some time looking into his thoughts, life, and ideas. So until next time, full sails on your journey.